All right, Biology 11 students, today's topic is Pathways of Evolution. All right, if you're an expert in French like me, it's Pathways of Evolution, of course. Anyway, um, our little title slide here today has the three pathways we're going to be examining. All right, so let's get into it here. The first two pathways that we're going to look at are these two right here. All right. Divergent and convergent pathways of evolution. This first one is divergence. A divergence is a split, all right? So you can imagine if this blue arrow was the 401, the red arrow would be like one of the off ramps that takes you into, you know, each different little town will have several little off ramps. And that is a splitting, a divergence off of the main highway, all right? A convergent pathway is like, well, that's the on-ramps to the highway. It's like this. So again, if the blue highway, if the blue arrow is the main highway, the red arrow turns its way into it and they converge, they get together. So divergence is splitting apart, convergence is getting together. And of course, our last one, which isn't on this slide, it is coevolution. All right. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So a divergent evolutionary pathway is where two or more species evolve and become increasingly different with respect to their traits, their appearance, right? So they may still live in the same larger geographic area, but now they've probably started to specialize in different areas of that environment, right? They're, they're taking on different ecological niches, roles within the environment. And so the checklist in one area of the environment that Mother Nature has is different than her checklist for the other area. And you have to have the traits that allow you to live in that area. And that's according to her demands and selection pressure, that checklist, right? So if we have two different environments in the same larger geographic area, then you would evolve different traits to survive in one area versus the other, right? In the movie Darwin's Dangerous Idea that we had to watch, we talk, uh, the scientists in that movie talked about birds. Some lived in the Amazon basin, the rainforest, and others migrated up into the Andes, the mountains. And they looked at how the birds changed and said, hey, these two birds are different species now, but they may have came from the same ancestral species. And you have the ones that stayed in the basin and the ones that went up into the mountains. All right, so they're starting to diverge and become different from their original population because, well, the mountains require different things of you than the Amazon basin does. Disruptive selection can also be a precursor here. We talked about disruptive selection, and our main example of that was hummingbird beak lengths. And we said, you know, the current population norm, the medium beak, is heavily selected against, and the two extremes, the small and the large beaked birds, are now heavily favored for, they're selected for. And so what we see is the small beaks and the large beaks, right, beak size became the difference and they no longer freely interbreeded, so they became different species. Another phenomenon we're gonna talk about today is adaptive radiation. Adaptive radiation happened with Darwin's finches where it was believed one species of finch came over to the Galapagos Islands from South America and gave rise to many different finch species. Uh, you might remember that one part in that same movie, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, where Gould, the bird expert, says to Darwin, these aren't gross beaks and wrens, and the, they're all finches, all right? They're all from that one ancestral finch that maybe got blown over to the islands or was able to fly over there by luck, right? So. Adaptive radiation is another example of convergent, or sorry, adaptive radiation is another example of divergent evolution. Now, convergent evolution, right? That's our middle one here, where we're becoming more and more similar, right? Divergent and convergent, the exact opposite. One is splitting apart, one is coming together. So two or more species become increasingly similar with respect to their traits. And the reason for that is they would have a similar environment. So they develop homoplasies, and homoplasies, what they are, are similar traits that form from species that have very different descents or ancestors. And so, for example, 
if we look within mammals, there's placental mammals and marsupial mammals. And if you look at Australia, Australia is like a haven for marsupials. And Australia also has a ton of different environments inside of it, right? There's desert, there's swampland, there's mountain ranges, there's coastal regions. So Australia has this plethora of different environments. If you go out to the rest of the world where the placental mammals kind of dominate, you'll find these same environments. There are mountain ranges out there and swamplands out there and all of that. And what they found was because the checklist is the same for a swamp in Australia and a swamp in Florida, the creatures develop similar characteristics, similar traits that help them survive. Because a swamp checklist is pretty much the same all around the world. Same thing with mountains. Mountains in Australia, the Andes Mountains we just talked about in South America, or the Rocky Mountains. There are similar things on those checklists. So those creatures develop similar things, similar traits to cope. The shark and the dolphin also converge, right? The shark is chondrichthys. It's a cartilaginous fish. It has gills, right? The dolphin is a mammal, right? So you've got chondrichthys, class chondrichthys, and class mammalia. Yet if you look at the body plans of both the shark and the dolphin, they are remarkably the same. They have the dorsal fin, the same coloration, the streamlined body, the um, pectoral fins as well. So obviously, and they both live in the ocean, Mother Nature's checklist for the ocean requires them to have those similar body plans. Hey, this is the optimal body plan if you want to survive here, right? Sharks have been around since gazillions of years. So obviously that plan is really well fit to, the, to that ocean environment. And the dolphin, the mammal that moves back into the water, is starting to adopt those traits or has adopted many of those traits. So divergent evolution. It is now time for me to have a shot at redemption here. If you remember my map of Canada from an earlier lecture, it was terrible. Um, after I drew it, I went and looked online again to see how close I was. It, it wasn't even close. It was disgusting how bad I was. Anyway, let's try it again here. So, divergent evolution. This is a little map here of South America. And in this little red box right here, this is where the Galapagos Islands are. Now on here, it looks like they're less than an inch apart, right? In actuality, they're several hundred miles apart. So it's not like some animal can just swim over. It's not like swimming across the street, right? Some animal can't just swim over there. A lot of birds just can't fly over there. It's not happening, right? And here's a blown up picture of the Galapagos Islands, which are off the coast off of the uh, west coast of South America. So Darwin's finches, if you remember, I'll refer to that scene again. This is an example of divergent evolution and adaptive radiation. You have that one original finch, right? So I'm going to bear with me. We're going to give this a shot. Uh, not, not bad. So this is South America. These the islands are a lot easier to draw. These are the Galapagos Islands. All right. And our little finch is right here. So there's the finch in there. Now, the finch in South America, it ate seeds. All right, so it went around eating seeds of different plants, right? But the finch, <coughs> excuse me, the finch might have wanted to try other things, right? Like, oh, wow, look at those oranges over there. Oranges would be amazing. But if it went near the orange tree, the toucan is there. And the toucan says, hey, get lost, buddy. The oranges are mine. I've got the bigger beak. I'll crush you with it. Get out of here. Hit the bricks, kid. Right? Maybe it wanted to try a certain type of berry. But when it went after the berries, the parrots were there. I said, no, 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 the berries are our thing. We're bigger than you. We'll beat you up if you try to come near them. Get lost. Right? Maybe it wanted to try going after grubs. Oh, put that in the wrong spot. Right? Maybe it wanted to try going after grubs. But then there were maybe pheasants there. I don't know if pheasants eat grubs, but some sort of pheasant type of bird. 
lived in South America, right? All these things are living in here. Nope, you can't have those. Maybe there are some insects in the trees, right? I'm going to take these insects that live in the bark of trees. Then there was woodpeckers there. And the woodpecker ate the insects. And all of these birds lived in South America. So the finch was kind of, another bird term, pigeonholed into this small little niche. Right? So the finch had a small niche. And so there was the one type of finch, and that was basically it. Right? A niche is an ecological role. Hey, you're the seed-eating bird. That's it. Don't try this other stuff. There are other birds here that are already way better adapted to it. Don't. They'll outcompete you. You'll get crushed. Your numbers will go down. Stick to the seeds, kid. It's what you do well. The finch ends up making its way over to the Galapagos. So now our little finch is over here. I'll just designate him with a little F. And so we've got our finch that eats the seeds over in the Galapagos. Now the Galapagos, there's a huge geographic barrier there. We talked about geographic barriers um, creating conditions that can lead to speciation, right? Change in the species. And so this finch goes over there and it's eating seeds because that's what it's always done. And the numbers go up. There's no other birds here eating this stuff. So lots of seeds, no other birds around. They couldn't make the several hundred mile flight over to the Galapagos. And now it's eating seeds. Numbers go up. Well, the numbers keep going up, but the amount of seeds doesn't. So sooner or later, some of the birds say, you know what? It's getting harder and harder to get seeds because there's so many of us here. We're thriving now without the other competition around all these birds over here. So maybe I'll try something different. Maybe I'll try those insects. So you can imagine it going up to the tree, the finch, you know, looking over to like, where are those woodpeckers at? They're probably going to come over and grab me any second here, you know, knock me on the head and get rid of me. And so they try to go after the insects and, and nothing happens. There's no, there's no woodpeckers in the Galapagos. There, there were in South America, but not in the Galapagos. So some of the finches would have tried the insects that were living in the trees and that. And they would have had no competition. They would have had, oh man, these are actually really, really good. We should have been doing this long ago. And so they start to specialize. Some of them became tool using finches. Others developed a thinner, more streamlined beak that could get in the little nooks and crannies of the bark. And so they developed those traits and they specialize in becoming insect eating finches. Others, like we see here, went after leaves. I'm tired of eating seeds. There's too many eating seeds. I'm going to go over and try these leaves. They look very tasty. Now, over in South America, there might have been a, some sort of bird species that was great at eating leaves and said, get out of here, finches. I'm not having it. But on the Galapagos Islands, several, several hundred miles away, those other birds weren't there. So you could see the finch going over, kind of creeping over towards the leaves, like, oh man, I'm going to try some of these, but I'm afraid someone's going to get after me. No one was there. So they were able to eat the leaves and they developed beaks that were experts, you know, beaks that were perfect for cutting leaves. And the same thing for the large buds and fruit. We saw the toucans and the parrots. Larger birds would probably bully the finches and say, hey, get out of here. Those are ours. And then we saw where on the Galapagos, that competition wasn't there. So if the finch wanted to try those things and it liked it, it could start developing a beak that was a lot better. Now, again, when I say developing, the finch wasn't thinking, oh, I'm going to make my beak different. Random mutation occurs and little modifications make some finches better at getting into the buds and the fruit. And the same thing with the grubs. Digging the grubs out of the ground, again, there was a beak modification that happened through random mutation. They didn't direct their own evolution. That's Lamarck, not Darwin. And they were able to go after the grubs. Why? Because the pheasants or whoever was really good at getting grubs in South America weren't there. So the fact that there is reduced competition in all these empty niches, right? These Galapagos Islands had lots of empty niches what we saw was one species of finch over here radiate into a whole bunch, many species over here. And why? 
because it wasn't pigeonholed or held in check by these other competitors. And that was adaptive radiation. So that would look like this. You have your ancestral finch species that came over from South America. It hits the islands and it starts to do this. There's a development of two species from one. So speciation occurs. And then this species, it splits. And then another one. And another one and a split here, and a split here. So now there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Just in this little diagram, there are eight species that came from the ancestral first species that went over there. This is adaptive radiation. To radiate means to spread out, right? Adaptive means it's through adaptations. So through changes in body plans, and it was the beaks especially that Darwin noticed, we saw that the one species gave rise to eight different species. And it was actually more than eight species. Just my little diagram here has eight. So that's an example of divergent evolution, adaptive radiation, right? And that's kind of the story behind it. Now, if we look at convergent evolution, convergent evolution, if you remember, convergence means to go together, to come together. Now, one thing that we do know, convergent evolution is this. This is convergent. It means coming close and then they can kind of go off in this direction. That's convergence. All right, so this is convergent evolution. Right? It is not this. I don't want us to think that it's this, where that comes over and that comes over, and now we've got this one line coming from it. Remember, this doesn't happen. All right? So, this is not what's happening here. From an earlier discussion, I think maybe even the last lecture previous to this, we talked about species. Isolating mechanisms. Right? These species isolating mechanisms keep these two things from come, becoming one species. Remember the donkey and the mule, yes, they're physiologically and physically similar. The donkey and the mule, yes, they will freely interbreed. But the mule is sterile. It's not a viable offspring. So this doesn't happen. This is not convergent evolution. This is where they become very close. The dolphin and the shark, which were one of our examples of this. So I'll get rid of this because this is wrong. I don't want that to stay in our heads. The dolphin and the shark, the shark is chondrichthys. The dolphin is a mammal. They stay as separate species. They don't, they don't make, you know, dolphin sharks. It's not a thing even though there is something called the whale shark, I get it, but you know what I'm talking about. So the dolphins and the sharks won't become one species. They stay separated. There are some things, right? Obviously dolphins have lungs in the blowhole, sharks have gills, so there are differences that don't allow them to come become one species. So um, I found this picture, and this takes the modern dolphin, which is a mammal, and relates it back to, in the Jurassic period, an ichthyosaur. So an ancient dinosaur, but it was a reptile. And you can see even then, they were both ocean creatures. You can see the amazing body plan similarities that they would have had, right? So you see the dorsal fins here. You see the streamlined body, um, the pectoral fins as well, right? Even the pointed, rounded kind of snout on both of them. This picture, now you might have to blow this up on your own iPad or computer at home, but again, this is our mammals. We talked about Australia having a whole variety of different environments that are similar to various environments out on the rest of the planet. And so what this slide, what this picture is showing are examples of placental mammals from all over the earth that live in environments that are very similar to those in Australia. And we see the marsupial example of the same niche being filled in Australia. So even though one's a placental mammal, one's a marsupial mammal, you can see some of the body plans are remarkably similar 
Because again, Mother Nature's checklist in a forest in Australia is going to be similar to a forest in another continent. A swamp in Australia, similar to a swamp in another continent, right? A desert in Australia, you get the idea. So, and here's a slide here showing a shark, which is chondrichthys, it's a fish. The ichthyosaur, it's extinct, but still we can look at its body plan. And the modern day dolphin, which is a mammal. So, chondrichthys, reptilia, and mammalia are here. But again, what do they have in common? It's that environment. It's the selection pressure that Mother Nature puts on things, that, that grind, right? Hey, I've got my checklist, meet these demands or get out or die, right? So to meet the demands of that ocean environment, you can see the body plans are remarkably alike. So many similarities, but they don't come together exactly. So they become similar, they don't become the same. Now, coevolution is our last example here, our last pathway. And coevolution was this diagram. Coevolution was this one. And we'll see how that applies to this. So coevolution working together, and we see this in a lot of species that rely on each other for survival. So coevolution uh, occurs when one species evolves in response to the evolution of another species. So what that basically means is we have species A, the red species here, and we have species B, the green species here, and they're co-evolving. What happens is if A develops some sort of a trait, B develops a trait where it can keep coexisting with A. And if B changes, A changes to meet the traits of B. So these two things co-evolve right so there is a plant called the fig and there's the fig wasp right and the flower depends on the wasp for pollination we talked about that in our plants when we were doing diversity so the fig wasp is a pollinator for the fig plant right so the plant really needs the wasp to help it form seeds and, and continue to form the next generation the fig wasp requires the flower to reproduce. It lays its eggs inside of the flower, I believe. And then because they're buried in the flower, they're not exposed and you know the young can be protected somewhat, if I'm remembering that correctly. So what happens is um, one relies on the other to help produce the next generation. So you can imagine if the, if the flower evolved in some way, the wasp would still have to be able to to use that flower and the flower can't change too much where the wasp can no longer help it. So little changes in one will result in little changes on the other. And that's an example, if you remember, because it's only affecting a couple of species, that's micro evolution, right? All the other species around may be unaffected whatsoever, but a little random change in one will result in some sort of change in the other. Another one, leaf cutter ants and fungus. So you see that, you know, every time they show, um, I think these things are in the Amazon, they always show the leaf cutter ants carrying these humongous pieces of leaf in relation to their own body size along the forest floor and they take them underneath the ground, right? The ants don't actually eat the leaf. What they do is they feed a fungus. Now, if you remember a fungus, kingdom fungi, right? It eats dead and decaying material. Well, the leaf is cut off of the main body of the plant, so it's going to decompose and die and the fungus will eat that. Now, the fungus can only survive under the ground, right? The dark, humid, underground tunnels and that and burrows that these ants have. That's where the fungus thrives. So the ants basically cultivate the fungus underneath the ground, they feed the fungus. And then the ants feed off of the fungus. So if the fungus were to change in some way in terms of its dietary needs or whatever, the ants would have to adjust their behavior to continue to keep the fungus alive because that's what they eat. If they don't keep the fungus alive and they eat up all the fungus, then the ants die, right? And if the fungus no longer, for example, was found tasteful to the ants, the ants would stop looking after it and it would die. So the two of them have to rely on each other. And as one changes, the other one has to change with it. They both need each other to survive. 
Here's a great picture of, of coevolution. Here you can see um, an insect and the flower that it feeds nectar from. And so if we look here, there's the flower, and you can see it's got this quite an interesting length or back piece to it. And this is the proboscis. This, the long nose of the insect is actually called the proboscis. And you can see that it is exactly the same length as the flower. And that's not a mistake. You can imagine if this was really, really much longer, it would be a little more cumbersome for this guy to fly around. And he might be more easily caught by predators. And if it was shorter, he's not reaching the back end of the flower or the nectar maybe. All right, so this is the perfect length. Short ones aren't going to be able to feed. Longer ones, more cumbersome, like our hummingbird beaks, which we see in this picture. The hummingbird beak allows the head of the hummingbird to just stop you know, ever so gracefully at the end of the flower, but it can still feed. It's the perfect length for the native species of flower. And same thing like the insect. If it's too big, the bird doesn't fly as well. It can't evade predators as well. It requires more energy to carry that big nose around. If it's smaller, it can't feed. If this flower over time, if we use the flower as A, if the flower were to become longer, we'd see the beaks of the birds becoming longer. Coevolution, right? I watched this one special, and I wish I could find the video. If I can, I'll post it. It was um, of a desert plant that was being eaten by beetles, and it was looking at how the desert plant kept trying to protect itself from these be beetles that were eating it. So it developed a thicker cuticle, where the beetles developed a you know, stronger mouth parts, stronger mandibles. Then it developed thorns, and the beetles developed longer mandibles so it could still be there and longer legs, so it could still be on the plant, but the thorns weren't poking into it. And then it developed this, and the beetles did this. It was like a chess game, as you know, one-upsmanship all the time here between the two. And it was happening very, very quickly, within like a, a number of years. The biologists that were down there studying it couldn't believe that, how quickly the evolutionary processes were, uh, were you know, occurring, uh, this co-evolution was occurring in the desert. I'll try to find that video and get it to you. Here again, we saw this in Darwin's Dangerous Idea. It was one of the modern day scientists. And we can see here, this always amazes me. This is a praying mantis. Now our praying mantises up here in Ontario don't look like this. But the ones down in South America in the Amazon River Basin, you can see its abdomen and its thorax look exactly like leaves. And you can even see the venation pattern, the pattern of veins in the leaf are going the same way as the vein pattern in the insect. Now, the insect did not direct this, right? These are random little changes that allowed these insects with those random little mutations that created these changes to survive and thrive longer. And one thing that I always notice in this picture I really like is right here where the uh, thorax and abdomen meet, there's like this little brownish color which kind of meets, it's very similar to the brownish color in the decay of the leaf. And these two little dark, you know, lighter yellow green dots, they match this color here. So even the random little rotten and, and wear down colors on the leaf are being shown in various places on the insect. And you can imagine as a bird flies by, this would be mistaken as a leaf and it probably won't get eaten. If the leaf were to change something, a different pattern of venation, um, a different color, you'd probably see that in the praying mantis within a, you know, a generation or two. And that's it for today's lecture. There is more. Tomorrow we'll get into this stuff. But for today, we're calling it a day. I think that's enough. And uh, that's it. Anyway, I hope I made things clear. Um, if there's any comments, questions, concerns, you can put those into the comment section below this video on the YouTube comment section or reach out to me through Edsby. Anyway, that's it for today. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.